All right. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all again. I'm sorry again that I wasn't with you personally, so to speak, last week, but it's good to be back in a sort of live online and not just pre-recorded. So, and it was great to have some time to chat and catch up on some questions and things as well. So, wow, I really feel this has flown by with the time. We are in week six. We've, we're at the end of this thing, um, which is quite amazing. And um, I just want to say that it's been a pleasure being with you, and um, I look forward to seeing many of you um, face to face in the very near future with all the changes that are happening and things. Maybe we can even start getting coffees and stuff like that. Woohoo! Um, <clears throat> we'll see. But um, I do hope that this time has been a blessing for you, and um, and I really hope that it's given you a lot to think about. But I also hope that there are things from this last few weeks and including today that you can incorporate into your life as well. So that's my hope. I realize that you may have questions or some even some things to kind of want to um, check in about after this is over. And um, of course, these, um, these weeks are being put on YouTube. And so you can see my contact information every time you pull one of the weeks up on the front page. But um, my address there is phil at ywamknowledge.com and you can reach me um, at that email address if you want to stay in touch with any questions and things afterwards. And of course, it's not like I'm very far away, so cool. So yeah, so we've, these are the things we've looked at over the last few weeks and uh, we're gonna look at the gifts of the spirit today and I'm just gonna share some, as I've said, some practical things in relation to that as well. But let's, uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer. Um, keep your um, mics um, muted, but you might want to pray this prayer with me. I've just got Augustine written at the bottom. This is Augustine of Hippo, just to be clear, this prayer. So maybe you could say this with me. Let's make this a prayer for us to start this time of looking at the gifts of the Spirit. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. <laughs> so, yes, we're looking at the gifts of the Spirit. And the first thing I want to say about the gifts of the Spirit, again, because this has been such a contentious issue in the church and caused so much divisiveness and all of that, that the context for this, that all the gifts are intended to foster unity. And we're going to be seeing unity a lot in the things that are written today. Humility. <clears throat> that our identity is formed as secure in the love of God. Love. Romans 5, 5, remember, in week one. In the Holy Spirit who pours the love of God into our hearts. And then, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. I don't know how many of you grew up singing various types of children's songs and related to the Holy Spirit, but uh, I've got certain memories of a few, that's for sure. So Now, one of the things that I want to say that I think is very important as we begin to think about the gifts of the Spirit is that I want to remind us about our use of this phrase. They are gifts from Holy Spirit. Gifts from God, gifts from person. Gifts from person and not gifts from power. Remember again, Zechariah 4 8, not by might, not by power, but by Holy Spirit, but by Ruach. So it may sound obvious. But the gifts of the Spirit are gifts from Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's a very profound start there, isn't it? But I think sometimes we lose the depth of what that really means. 
as you can see here, I want to begin with something that we don't necessarily tend to see as a gift. And it's this very Christianese word, sanctification. Because Romans 15, 16 and 1 Peter 1, 22 here both say that we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It, and isn't it interesting because sanctified basically means to be made holy or to be separated or to be consecrated. This is part of the good news that Holy Spirit makes us holy. As Andy Park wrote in his brilliant worship song years ago, we are changed by God's glory. We're changed by God's glory and God's gifts. I like how Selwyn Hughes, there's a name that you might not have heard for quite a while, but uh, I love this quote of Selwyn Hughes when he said that we are changed by internal beckoning, we, we are changed by divine beckoning rather than internal bludgeoning. Isn't that great? You see, and this is a work of the, so this sanctification, this change is, is done by Holy Spirit. Ron Rollhauser, who's a, one of my favorite writers, he's a Catholic writer from Texas. Um, his book on prayer is one of the best books on prayer I ever read. It has a very deep title. It's called Prayer. Nice and easy to remember. And um, he said this. He, he describes consecration as being derailed from normalcy. And so when we think of being sanctified by the Spirit, We can be both normal, but also available to God not to be normal either <laughs> in terms of radical obedience and the things that God might want to say to us. We are sanctified by the Spirit. Now, I want to suggest to you as we, be, as we look at um, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 a fair bit today, and I'm going to jump around a little bit for the next few minutes, but... Um, I want to suggest to you tonight that it's not a coincidence that Paul uses the Corinthian church as his case study, study for a list of gifts of the Spirit. There's plenty of gifts mentioned elsewhere, and we're going to look at those quickly as well. But the thing about the Corinthian church is there is so much going on there that we can relate to today and people can relate to throughout the generations. The Corinthian church met at someone's house who was probably somebody quite wealthy. From what we understand, it was quite small, maybe around 50 people, maybe a bit more. It contained diversity of people from different sectors of society, both rich and poor. We know from what Paul wrote about communion that the church had, had its share of infighting. And yet the gifts of the spirit are at work and God is working in people's lives and God is speaking to them as a church. In spite of all of the stuff that's going on, this is why they're gifts of grace. And back in the days of when the Corinthian church was there, they're one of the things in the culture of Corinth was the trying of cases in the courts. And this almost became a form of entertainment where people would actually go to the courts and that was the place in which you were seen. That was the place of the local gossip. That was the place in which you went to get noticed. You see, and I want to suggest to you that some of the culture of the courts, the culture of what was going on in current, Corinth actually began to get fed into the things of the life of the church and the people in the church. And that's why so some of these problems in these issues that come up and why Paul wants to address his concerns to this particular body of believers. Now, and I just wanted to say, of course, in terms of being noticed and 
drawing attention to ourselves of course we don't have any problem with that in our own culture right now do we i mean there's social media and things like that <clears throat> yeah you see in ephesians chapter four paul talks about and i mentioned this in week two the unity of the spirit and he goes on to talk about and i'm just going to move over here and come back to corinth again in 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 ephesus Paul talks about five gifts. And he says that these gifts are meant to equip, they're meant to build up, they're meant to foster unity, and that all of those things are the things that actually bring about maturity. Again, I want to suggest we really need to think carefully about what it means when we talk about somebody being a mature Christian. What does that mean Biblically, rather than in Christian culture. That's something we need to ask ourselves at the moment, I suggest. So all of these gifts are meant to bring about unity. Apostles, very quickly. An apostle back in the days of the church, and we just had a sermon on this at St. Luke's just the last Sunday, <laughs> which was kind of handy. And um, originally apostles were people that not only were sent ones, which is what the word means, but they were people that had been direct witnesses of the resurrection. But the word apostle began to grow through the book of Acts as people who were being sent. And then once they were sent, of course, they planted churches and those churches planted churches. And so the apostles eventually became people that were leaders of movements. And I want to suggest to you that that is the most common definition of an apostle today is a leader of movements. So the thing about an apostle is, is that apostles are important. They, it is a gift of being an apostle, but please do not ever call yourself one. Let other people do that. Prophets talked about this um, last week, but I do just want to mention a quick quote. Quote from um, if I've got it in my notes here, I'm not seeing it. It's um Dan um Dan um oh my gosh. I don't have it here. If I find it, I'll tell it to you. But I did have a quote on prophecy that was basically it was about the importance of the, anyone that is of a prophetic nature actually bringing people together rather than causing alienation. So you, you get the idea. It's tied in with unity again. And we talked about prophecy, of course, a lot last week. Teachers. Teachers are people that are meant to explain the word of God and the nature and character of God in a way that hopefully makes sense to people so that they grow in their intimacy and relationship with God when in a Christian context. Simple as that. That's what I hope I'm doing in these six weeks, please, Lord. Um, <clears throat> that's the goal. Um, and obviously, teachers are held to a higher account, it says. So we need to be very careful about what we say. We don't always do the best job of that. but. Then there's evangelists, people that just have this natural tendency, ability to be able to share faith with people. You know, I am not naturally one of these people, but when I'm around others that are like this, it's an incredible thing to behold. I was at a conference in Prague right before the pandemic started last year, and I was in meetings with a lady from Sweden, from Stockholm, and she's an evangelist. And oh my goodness, she got involved in people's lives in ways that are unbelievable for the space of being in Prague for a week. And I was just in awe of the way that she related to people and shared about the love of Jesus in a way that was incredibly loving, caring, and unassuming, and yet also very powerful. It was a delight to see. And then you got pastors. Oh, boy. This one's a biggie. And let me, cause, because I want to suggest to you that in the last, especially in more recent years, and not necessarily so much in the Church of England, but within wider frame of the body of Christ, pastors have tended to become people in the Western world and other parts of the world too, where they're almost hired to be leaders of um, mini corp of CEOs of mini corporations rather than people that are paid to come alongside and care for souls of people. 
The word pastor literally means shepherd. You know, so it is a call to care. It is a call to come alongside. It is a call to lead. It's, it's also a call to not lord over. <laughs> and the pastoral gifting is not attached to a position. The pastoral gifting is someone that can have in any walk of life. And so we've done service, I think, to the pastoral call by placing it in the context of position rather than the gift that God wants to release as the person that cares for people's souls in a way of blessing the church. And I think this is especially relevant and important for us in this day and age that we release and encourage the pastoral gifting in our churches <clears throat> and in our organizations as well on a constantly wider level. So a few explanations there. And then we have Romans 12 where giftings are mentioned again. And this one I actually find quite funny because when you read this, you think this is really deep, right? Because in Romans 12, it says prophecy. And then it says, if, you, if, you, if prophecy, then prophesy. If teaching, then teaching. If serve, then serve. If encouragement, encourage people. It's pretty deep stuff, isn't it, again? Um, I do just want to say one thing about service, a, a gift of service. These are people that have a natural tendency to just help people in amazing ways. I have two dear friends back in California where I used to live who have this through the roof and they're like a dynamic duo together, these two guys. And they just, their first question with almost anybody they come across is what can I do to help you? How can I help you? What do you need? If you're the kind of person where you have a natural bent for that to be the first stuff that comes out of your mouth, that is a gift of service. Encouragement. I remember a young guy named Peter went on to be a youth pastor who I never met anyone like him. He just naturally could go to someone and make them feel better in seconds by saying, hey, buddy, you can do it. You're doing such a great job. And it was incredible. Giving. It talks about giving without hypocrisy or pretense and giving being something that's cheerful. And obviously, this can be talking about the giving of our time and our energy and things like that. But no, this is mostly talking about money. There are people that have a gift of giving, a natural tendency to want to take their money and to put it into places where it's needed. And they take that as a serious calling. Then we have hospitality. Oh, my goodness, such a highly undervalued gift. This is the gift that my wife has through the roof. She is amazing in this area. And uh, we've done a lot of reading and study. We, I could spend a whole, you could spend a whole week just looking at hospitality. If you want to read about hospitality, I highly recommend Henry Nowen as a great way to start in terms of some of the things that he has to say about that. What a blessing. And then leadership, he says, be diligent. <laughs> what does that tell you about leadership? But there is a way in which leadership is a gift when people are following you in a way in which you're actually standing alongside them and walking with them, but they're going in a direction at the same time. <laughs> so here's the thing. When it comes to the gifts of the spirit, all of us are called to all, I want to suggest to you that as we get into Corinthians again in a second, that all of these things are available to us in some way. The one complicated one about that, as we've talked about last week already, is tongues. I don't really have all the clear answers for that when it comes to tongues and interpretation, but I'm going to say a few things about that in a minute. But generally speaking, I want to suggest to you that this is, but the question in all of this is, what is your emphasis that you see? What are you already been doing that stands out in how you serve God and how you serve others? Because that's what that's what the gift is. If you if you're doing this stuff and you have an emphasis for one thing, you know, that you where you say, oh yeah, I have this natural tendency towards that where I'm doing it, that means that you've you're that's what you're gifted in. 
you know, the gifts aren't some, you know, and yes, can you ask for a gift and pray for a gift and it's given to you? Well, yeah, absolutely, because it's a gift. <laughs> but most of the time, the gifts of the spirit are simply things where God is, because you're made in his image and he gives us different gifts, that the things that you have, they usually need to be developed or encouraged because they haven't been developed or encouraged but you have a tendency so you might have a passion for evangelism but nobody is encouraging or helping you and what that means you might have a, a passion to serve in the community but it's like how do i go about doing that and we'll see this more with the gifts in corinthians as well but this is the question i begin to want to seed into our minds for tonight in terms of how we think 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. The first thing I want to do is remind us of, do you remember the sandwich I talked about in the first week? I talked about the Old Testament sandwich of the silence in the middle being the meat of the sandwich for peacekeeping on the one side and reaching the nations on the other. Um, and then here in 1 Corinthians 12, we've got the gifts of the spirit on one slice of bread. On 14, we've got words about tongues and prophecy on the other slice of bread. And we've got one of the most famous love poems in the world written by Paul as the meat in the middle. 1 Corinthians 13 is used all over the world for all kinds of things, including weddings and what have you, by many people that might not even know the source of it. <clears throat> it's a remarkable beautiful piece of literature so it's, it's a standalone but it also is the meat of this sandwich of the gifts of the spirit as well <clears throat> excuse me and i want us to notice that the beginning of 1 corinthians 12 talks about the gifts in terms of same god same lord same spirit and again we have a theme here Notice that, first of all, even within the gifts, being the gifts of the Spirit, we have Trinitarian language here. And the second thing that I want us to notice, of course, is that what we have within Trinitarian language is language of community and language of unity. And this, again, we have this as the intended context for where we go with this in terms of um, looking at the gifts so here they are the gifts list as i call it because lists were actually quite common things to write down back in the day back in that time and that's what this is it's a list <clears throat> and so the first one wisdom I want to read us a quote from T.S. Eliot that I think is so relevant for us. The fact that he wrote this, I think in the 1930s, I think he wrote this. It might have been the 20s. I'm not 100% sure. But it's mind-blowing that that was the case for them. He says, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge that we have lost in information? And I want to suggest to us tonight that the more we get lost in information and we move away from knowledge, the more we move away from wisdom. Wisdom, I define wisdom as the voicing in God's time and God's way of revelation that addresses the issue at hand. I actually had the blessing of praying that gift of wisdom over somebody that runs a homeless ministry in the US just this afternoon. It's a huge blessing to be able to do that. This is another gift that I believe my wife has very strongly, certainly more than me. But we see this in the Bible with Solomon. We see this among people that we work with. When I was pastoring in the church that I used to lead, there was a man on our eldership um, who um, I actually just chatted to again this week, funnily enough. And um, in these meetings, they could get quite heated sometimes. 
And people were just like, you know, well, we need to do that. And we need to think that. And all the visionaries like me are just getting stuck in and doing all of this stuff, you know, the Enneagram fours for Sam and Martin, just to mention, you know. Um, and, um, and we'd all end up stopping. And then our eyes were turned to this gong guy and he would just say something completely deadpan, but so powerful, like solved everything. And we're like, why the heck didn't we just ask this guy in the first place? You know, it was hilarious. That's the gift of wisdom. Words of knowledge. A word of knowledge is simply something that is shared with another person through a revelation of the spirit where it's something they couldn't possibly know. Back in my musician days, I got a picture of a boy. And I was going to do a gig in a park in Vancouver. And I felt the Lord speak to my heart and say, you're going to meet this person in Vancouver. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, <laughs> so when I get to the park, and sure enough, that person that I saw in a picture in prayer was... Um, standing across the way with this church group involved in this outreach we were doing with this this gig we were doing with this band and i just went over and talked to him and said and i told him it was the kind of safe environment to be able to do this sort of thing i said i hope this isn't too weird but you know and i told him about what had happened in terms of seeing him in prayer and stuff with a little bit of fear and trembling and I prayed a blessing over him and that was it and that got the oh so much for that being a big deal next day the pastor that was in charge of the outreach comes to me and says um did you talk and pray for a boy yesterday and I'm like Ooh, I'm in trouble he said that that and by the way he's a teenager he wasn't like a little kid and um and he said to me, that, that boy was my son. And my son got up this morning and sat with me at the breakfast table and said, Dad, there was this man that came and talked to me yesterday about how he had seen me in prayer a couple of months ago and he was told that he was going to meet me. And he goes, just yesterday morning I got up and I had all these doubts about the, uh, whether I really believed in God or not. And this guy shows up the afternoon and has just restored my faith in the Lord. That's a word of knowledge. Lots of other stories on that, but, which I wish I had time for, but we, uh, we don't. Um, gift of faith. I used to love the way that Barry Maguire, who's the, I don't know if you remember, I'm really showing my age with Barry Maguire. He was a 60s kind of hippie Christian singer that was brilliant. And um, Barry Maguire decided to dis define the gift of faith like this, knowing in your knower. And I think that's a brilliant description, as good as we're going to get. It's knowing in your knower. I remember when um, we were on an outreach in Albania and my daughter got extremely ill, I mean, seriously ill. And there were people all over the world praying for her. So I'm not going to make this sound like there's anything hyper spiritual about me in any of this. And the churches there in Albania were praying. People were praying all over the place. And I went to a prayer meeting where people prayed over me. And I went back to Emma and I laid my hands on Emma. And there was something I knew more than I've ever known in my life that God was going to heal her. It, there was a knower in my knower that went through the roof. And I just prayed over her. And there was an authority there that I don't know that I've ever known at any other time. And she got better. Again. Again, that's not about me, it's because there was everyone was praying, but there was something significant in my own experience for that that kind of shows that that gift of faith, knowing in your knowing. Gift of healing, we talked about that more last week, but the question in that is, do you have a natural tendency to have a heart and desire to pray for the sick? Gift of miracles. In Acts, it talks about they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. We see this with Jesus turning water into wine, that wonderful symbol of life. We see Jesus helping Peter to pay his taxes by telling him to go and open the mouth of a fish. Hmm. That's miracles. Miracles are things that can't be explained that draw us to God. 
I was on an outreach in India when, um, well, and um, just better check the time again. Oh boy. Um, I was on this outreach in India where, um, again, it was, it was a musician thing. I was playing with this band and we were doing this outdoor concert and um, somebody came up on the stage and I had a kindy translator and there were a number of us still sharing different things. And this man came up and spoke in English over the microphone. And there were about five, 600 people in the audience of this thing, all staring at us. And this guy says, we're from the local agricultural college. Our friend has been kidnapped and we want you to pray that he will be released within 24 hours. And I'm the one standing there with the microphone. <laughs> so I pray this like pathetic, wimpy prayer in front of like five, 600 people. And the long and the short of it is, is this person got released from, uh, you know, from this kidnapping situation. We found out actually it wasn't uncommon because it was a college where people, kids from government actually were going to. And so they did it for money and stuff. And all kinds of cool things happened as a result of that. Is there a tendency to see miracles and to experience miracles and to pray for miracles? Discerning of spirits. This is where there is somebody that has an insight into the spiritual realm for stuff that's going on that can be prayed into for things to be made a difference. Again, I talked a bit about this last week. There was a man named Peter in our church who had this gift and would come to me and say, in a beautiful, humble, unassuming way and say, I feel like the Lord is speaking and showing you. And he had this gift. And man, I tell you, what a, what a blessing of a gift to have in the body of Christ. I tell you, when it's done in a humble, you know, unassuming way, it's a beautiful thing. And it can really be helpful in terms of noticing things that other people don't see. It's fantastic. So, <clears throat> so there's people that have like a gift of discerning of spirits. Now, we've got speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and um, prophecy. And um, I already spoke about personal tongues. So I want to talk more now about uh, tongues in the church. You see, and what we see when it comes to the gift of tongues and then you talked a little bit about this before the session started earlier on. We have an evangelistic context that we see where it talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 about tongues being for the unbeliever. You've got the personal context where it says that um, tongues edifies the person. And then we've got the tongues that's spoken in church where Paul gives out almost like a mini protocol for how to actually deal with the word of tongues in a church situation. So we see these things in, and, and this is a very complex passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians 14. And I'm suggesting to you that this can be a way of a simple, helpful way of looking at it for the combination of our experience of these gifts and the realities of what goes in church and for biblically what's there. There's obviously going to be others that have different views and opinion, and I'll say more about that in just a second. So <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to share with you a little bit about how in the past I've handled situations that have come up in regards to the use of these gifts. But I want to say this first. I realize that as I talk about this, this part of things in the gifts of the spirit, especially that there may be people watching this later on on YouTube or listening even now that either don't believe that this kind of activity should be happening in the present day. And there may be others that haven't experienced what I'm gonna talk about. But I wanna say that I very much respect the opinions of people that do think differently about these things. And I wanna say that I respect your views and I've worked with people with bad experiences from church, from all kinds of backgrounds. Had bad experiences of church myself for that matter. 
And I understand that there is much out there that can easily put us off of church. <laughs> but there is nothing more important as I share these things than our revelation of the nature and character of God and our seeing that the saviour and creator of the universe is both loving and worth knowing. And I want us to be able to take what we understand from all of this with the goal of it bringing about us becoming closer to God, more loving and more caring, more mindful and more integrated as people. So please, within whatever you hear, especially within the complexities of these ideas, I actively encourage you to both eat the meat and throw out the bones. In terms of what gets achieved in your life and those priorities that I really think are most important, okay? So I wanted to say that just to kind of help understand the heart behind this and that context of unity and that context of, of um, maturity even as well. So some of you may have been in church situations in the past where a word in tongues got spoken. And sometimes this can be a very cool thing. I have a friend that was in a church in Sacramento, California, where a, a person was visiting from Vietnam and um, they got to the end of a worship time and one person on one side of the audience actually spoke in, it turns out, shared a word in tongues. Another person gave another word in tongues and then the visiting missionary stood up and said, that was one dialect of Vietnamese and that was another dialect of Vietnamese and that completely speaks into what God is leading us to in our ministry as missionaries in Vietnam. You can have cool stuff like that happen. Isn't that great? But other times, it can be a situation, if we're really honest, where it's just plain awkward. It takes a lot of bravery to stand up in a church and feel like you've got a word in tongues to say and actually come out and do it in a church. That's a gutsy thing to do for people that are in church environments where that kind of thing is done. And sometimes someone will give a word in tongues and you've just got a whole bunch of silence and nothing. And everybody's in silence sort of waiting for this awkward moment of, is there going to be an interpretation? Is the person going to give this interpretation themselves or is going to somebody just going to have to come up and say something nice to move us on because of how awkward this feels? Let's be real. That, that happens all the time. And I want to suggest to you that even though Paul says, pray for the interpretation of your tongue, the value of the New Testament is primarily a team approach. So I want to suggest to you that even though Paul says that, the ideal is for it to come from someone else. And sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes somebody that gave, gives the tongue will give their own interpretation, but it's actually just something that they're sort of making up in their mind to make everybody feel better rather than something that's clearly been led by God so that we can kind of move on to something else. These are the realities of church life, if we're honest about it. And what I do, if I'm a leader in situations like that, what I go do is I stand up and I explain what's going on. And I'll just explain to the audience, look, I realize that some of you might be visiting here today. Some of you might not know what's happening with this. There is this place in the Bible where it talks about this thing called tongues, where something's said in a language where no one can understand. And it's the way of God speaking to us. Why that could be the case, I have absolutely no idea. But it is a part and parcel of what's in the Bible in terms of how things can happen and how God may want to speak to us sometimes. So this is what's happening here. So... Um, it doesn't happen very often. Sometimes it happens in ways where it sort of doesn't work out. And other times it's a really powerful thing. And what I find is by simply standing up and explaining something like that in a very down to earth way, it puts people's minds at rest. Rather than just carrying on with a sense of awkwardness where people leave and wonder, well, what the heck was going on there? So, I hope that helps. There's a pastoring of these things. Um, something else that I'm very passionate about is the pastoring of these gifts. And obviously that's a whole other subject that I'm really into as well. But 
Um, the other, another question that I often, when I do this thing for the entire a week long course on this, I come, I almost always get asked, well, what do you do about people singing in tongues in worship services on Sunday mornings? And again, there are many fragrances in the body of Christ in terms of what we're called to do. That's obedience to God as a church. When I had that happening in my church, I had some people that were new believers and people that were visiting that found that very difficult to hear on a Sunday morning. And it was kind of affecting them in other areas of concern in terms of their relationship with God. So what I felt for the culture of the church that I was leading was, is that I said, look, there are people that want to do this. So I actually just flat out said to the church, we're not doing this on Sunday mornings but we're going to have Sunday night renewal meetings on a regular basis where we all get together and those that want to do it, they go at it doing that on Sunday night. So everybody knows that that's going to happen on the Sunday night and we don't do that so much on the Sunday morning because I felt that fitted the culture of the church and the dynamic of what God was doing in that particular situation. Again, I'm not saying that's the right thing for everyone, but it's important that we seek God and we hear God about these things in terms of the kinds of practices that we have and how we work on these things and develop them together. The quote on prophecy that I wanted to share was from Dan Berrigan, where he says, a prophet must make a vow of love and not of alienation. Finally, and probably a good thing it's getting on, but last but not least, there is another gift that doesn't get talked about, and I think it is a gift, and it is the gift, it's called, it's the word ectenios in Greek, and, it, and I'm probably butchering the language there, but um, in 1 Peter 22, it means the gift of loving the church. It talks about the love of the brethren. So there is a gift there as well. So I wanted to mention that. Back at the beginning of, I talked about um, what are your initial conceptions? What are the original thoughts about Holy Spirit? And as we go to our breakout groups, I want us to think about that and think about what are some of the things that I've learned through these last six weeks that may be a different than what I'd heard before about Holy Spirit? in terms of what my initial per perceptions, so I meant to say perception, not conception, um, what your initial perceptions were about who Holy Spirit is. Remember, all accord, but what is the emphasis that you see? What have you been already doing that stands out in terms of how you serve God and serve others? And my final, my final thought, is this. I just want to say that I have a huge amount of faith and hope for this, uh, for the upcoming generations. And I really believe that God is raising up some really powerful things in terms of this generation and the ones beyond being peacemakers, creators, lovers of God, unifiers, welcomers, and understanding of kingdom living people. And I just want to encourage all of us to take what we've learned here and what we learn about our walk with God and make sure that we're being people that are passing it on to young people and to the generations around us. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are the one who reminds us. I thank you that you remind us of being filled with the spirit for a food program, for creativity. Being comforted, being convicted, being consoled, being filled to be good news to the poor, being filled with the spirit for healing and for freedom in people's lives and for ministering into injustice and also being given gifts from you that unify your church and bring people together in love and humility to make the difference in the world that you want us to make. Fill each one here and guide each one here to live out the gifts of the spirit that you have given them and the ones that you are going to give them. And help each one to process the emphasis of what you've already done in their life and what you intend to do. 
Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'd really like to close if you'd like to unmike and if we could just all say the grace together, remembering the words of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit being the key part for us and what we've been looking at together. Okay, so I know, I know it's a bit messy, but let's do it, okay? <laughs> May the grace, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, Christ and, and the, the love of, of God, God and the fellowship, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us all. Amen. 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 All right. Love, God's blessing, and the fullness of the Spirit to you all. Amen. Amen.